Hi, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, Analyzing Crime Data for Informed Decision Making. My name is John Beck, Esri Law Enforcement Manager, and I'm joined today by Dave Wheeloth and Nick Port. Dave and Nick come from Esri Partner Cybertech, and they manage GeoShield. GeoShield is built on the Esri platform and integrates your existing systems and sensor data into a portal for visualization, sharing, and collaboration. Today, they're going to show us how GeoShield can be used for investigative support and also add value to your existing Esri licensing. As always, feel free to ask questions in the chat window, and we'll either answer them during the presentation or at the end during our Q&A. With that, let's turn it over to Dave to get us started. Dave? Okay, John, thank you very much, and thanks to Esri for the invitation. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Well, I currently work for CyberTech, and I'm assigned to uh, GeoShield. My career is actually in law, or my background is in law enforcement. I began back in the mid-80s, and at that time we really didn't have much in the way of technology. And the things I've seen and experienced since that time with respect to technology and law enforcement have really been incredible, especially geospatial capabilities. It's these types of things that are helping public safety agencies understand and really embrace that data-driven decision-making process and really become more efficient and effective at what they do. So for today's presentation, we're going to discuss a, a scenario on how an agency can utilize these geospatial technologies to bring disparate data together as part of a data-driven response to a problem that they're facing. So the scenario we'll discuss involves how a law enforcement agency can better respond to a violent crime series. And what we mean by this is simply crimes of a repetitive, repetitive nature committed by the same person or persons. And most of us associate these types of events with things like serial killers, but they can also involve uh, other types of crimes. So the first step um, in dealing with a situation like this is actually to recognize there's a problem. Um, if you don't uh, or if you're not aware that there's there's something like this going on in your community, it really makes it difficult to to put together an action plan. And while this critical first step takes place within the law enforcement agency where the crimes are occurring, um, Esri and GeoShield can play a part in this. The resources and tools that we can provide enable law enforcement agencies to understand more clearly what their data is telling them so they can see how things are changing sooner and then respond more efficiently to those changes. So this scenario will involve a string of aggravated robberies. So an aggravated offense will involve a weapon, um, the same location, uh, same locations are, are being selected for each of these crimes and those are, they are happening at ATMs. And victims and witnesses are giving similar and same descriptions of the suspect the weapon and the behavior or the MO of the suspect is the same across all of these crimes. So once we realize that we have a problem, the next step is to identify what the scope of that problem is. So how many events are we dealing with and over what period of time and across what geographic area? So even at this early stage in the process, we can begin to say, see how geospatial geospatial technology is is important to understanding what's what's actually happening with respect to this crime series. So once we reach this point, the next step, and, and understand too, the, the things that we're talking about uh, as far as what law enforcement will be doing, this is fairly high level stuff. There'll be a lot more things going on uh, down in the, uh, the weeds, so to speak, with what these agencies are doing to respond to this particular crime series. So the first uh, step is to develop a response plan. Uh, what resources will we need for this? Do we have enough manpower to adequate, adequately respond? Are there technology needs that we can bring to the table to help us deal with this? And are there outside agencies that can help us deal with this situation? And with respect to uh, the geographic um, extent of these crimes, if it crosses jurisdictional boundaries, then you'll have more than one law enforcement agency involved in this response plan. So it's important to identify that early on. And is there expertise that we can, we can bring in from another agency to help us deal with this? Second, what additional data or information is needed? We really need to have a very clear picture of what's happening before we can draw up an effective response plan. Once we have all of that data in, and information, we need to turn that into something actionable and then execute the plan. 
the plan execution will typically involve two different parts. The first is the actual criminal investigation where you'll have investigators uh, interviewing victims and witnesses. They're looking at any physical evidence or uh, electronic evidence, surveillance film and things like that that may exist in an attempt to identify who is committing these crimes and then to, to locate them. And the second part are those forward-looking proactive efforts designed to prevent more of these events from occurring. So you may have things uh, such as physical stakeouts where officers are out surveilling target locations, electronic surveillance if it's appropriate, and other things that are happening within the agency. So now that we understand what the scenario is that we're, that we're responding to, let's talk a little bit about what GeoShield can do to assist in this process, and that is visualizing the problem and the solution. So law enforcement have, has access to a lot of different types of data and data that comes from a lot of different sources. So GeoShield can give them the ability to view all of that data in real time. And given the dynamic nature of law enforcement in general and cases like the one that we're talking about today, having that real-time access is really mission critical to the things that they do. Second is to give them the ability to view it spatially. The data has much more meaning, as we'll see here shortly, when we can view it in a map. We can see where events are increasing or decreasing in frequency. We can see other things that may be driving that uh, increase or decrease. We can make those comparisons to other data sets that we have access to. So again, getting that um, a more accurate detailed view of what the scope of the problem is. And then with respect to the solution, what type of analytics can we bring to bear? And a lot of these things do exist in, in GeoShield. When we want to take a look at geographic areas, when we make the comparisons to the different data sets, and then have simple and effective operational workflows. So all of these things come into play with respect to, to really getting a, a good understanding of the problem and the solution. Just taking a step beyond that, some of the other things that GeoShield can assist with with respect to these types of problems and the day-to-day -day operations uh, within law enforcement is, again, data integration. Modern law enforcement has access to so much information coming from so many different places. The challenge becomes how do we get our arms around all of that information and use it effectively for these data-driven uh, decision-making processes. So, so we bring that all together into one time and place. We're also data agnostic. These different data sets, the data is structured differently. The method of acquisition is different from data set or database to database. So we help them again consume it all regardless of, of the structure or source. GeoShield is also CGIS compliant. So CGIS, or the Criminal Justice Information Services Security Policy, is the federal mandate for how law enforcement agencies can collect, can store, can share, and purge the information they have access to. So things like uh, an individual's social security number or their date of birth, criminal histories, and things like that. So these standards are very high, and it's uh, uh, subject to, to um, regular screening by the FBI to ensure compliance. We can also integrate live feeds. So if an agency has access to surveillance cameras, to geo-enabled assets like the GPS in the police cars, things like that also can be consumed and become part of that agency's GeoShield environment. It's also an effective information and intelligence sharing tool for the law enforcement agencies who have integrated GeoShield into uh, their agencies. Um, arsenal of, of uh, resources. It's an enterprise solution, so rather than limit uh, availability to a couple of analysts or tie it to a couple of computers, everyone from top to bottom has access to this. It's also extremely easy to use. Understanding who our end users are and what their capabilities are is important. Um, we're talking about law enforcement professionals. So most of what happens inside of GeoShield is driven by mouse. And it's also very uh, flexible, regardless of the agency type that's involved, whether it's a large metropolitan agency or an agency that's uh, small and more rural, GeoShield can, can meet their needs. 
So let's take a closer look at GeoShield. So the default view for a GeoShield user is a street map around the client agency. So Daytona Beach Police Department in Florida is one of our customers and they've provided some sample data. So we're taking a, taking a look at street map around uh, in the Daytona Beach, Florida area. We can switch to three different base layers. We can go from the street map to a topographic map and see some of the other geographic features in the community. And we also have aerial imagery. And this is uh, pretty important for law enforcement. And as we zoom in, we see the resolution for the imagery is pretty high. A lot of agencies do have access to third-party vendors uh, aerial imagery, but if I'm in the field responding to an event as it's unfolding, to be able to pull something like this up and coordinate uh, approaches to a target location and then containment, things like this are extremely valuable. So let's talk a little bit more about the live feeds. And as we step through this, keep in mind that scenario that we're dealing with. We've got a series of, of armed robberies taking place at ATMs in our community. So one of the live feeds that's available are the incoming calls for service. That's one of those nonstop flows of uh, requirements that come into law enforcement agencies. People are calling 911 because of an emergency or calling a non-emergency line requesting police services. So we can turn on that feed and see all of those incoming calls for service in this uh, map environment. So as new calls are received, they'll plot on the map. The icons are interactive and they're color coded based on call priority. So in the pop-up is rendered the information that the client agency wants to see. So you'll also uh, see notes relating to if weapons are involved in the event that's being reported, license plate numbers, suspect descriptions, and things like that. More and more agencies have geo-enabled assets, the most common one being the police car. There's a, a GPS component there, so we can turn this layer on as well and see where our assets are located. So now we see the little police car icons populating the map. And in the live environment for a client, you would actually see these assets moving around. So for a management or a situational awareness standpoint, to see where my problems are occurring, to see where my assets are, makes it really easy to manage. License plate or reader technology is becoming more mainstream in law enforcement, and that also becomes another, another live feed source here, as are cameras. So I turn on the camera layer. I see the live feeds in the large view pane, and then each of the individual icons showing the location of that actual asset, and then I can stream that live in the pop-up as well. So if we have calls for service coming in in proximity to cameras, the responders can pull that up and see if there's real-time actual, actual things they can see relating to the calls that they're responding on. So let me uh, remove a couple of these layers. Social media is also a live feed here. And many agencies are sharing information with the public via social media, but social media is also a, a very powerful intelligence gathering tool. Consider the event that took place in Orlando over the weekend. Uh, that event stretched out and lasted more than three hours and you still had civilians inside of the club, um, hostages taken, and a lot of those people were posting information on social media. So to be able to mine this information and get a clear picture about what was happening inside that building would be of great value to those that uh, were responding to that event. But it's a simple resource to use. It's a keyword search. Identify a buffered area on the map. And we see the tweets that, uh, that match that keyword search. So again, a, a great intelligence gathering tool. And what we've seen in law enforcement, too, is a lot of the folks who are involved in, in criminal activity, uh, we saw it a lot with our gang members, are using social media to brag and, and talk about things that they've been involved in. So sometimes it's, uh, um, it's something that winds up being uh, 
uh, used later in court against somebody who's being prosecuted. In addition to those live feeds, we make connections in, into things like the agency records management system. So everything that a law enforcement agency is involved in, when they write a police report, when they issue a traffic citation, when they stop a suspicious person, all of those events are documented and reside in that agency's records management system. So this is also available through, through GeoShield. I can select a, a day range or a custom date range, select the events that I want to render, and they're displayed on the map. So we're looking at some crime data over the, the previous 90 days. We could look at anything here, as we'll see shortly with respect to this scenario that we're discussing. So it's a, a great resource, pretty powerful tool for law enforcement. We also bring in persons of interest. A lot of agencies have access to active arrest warrants data. So those folks who are wanted because they've committed a crime and have yet to be uh, brought into the criminal justice system or people who uh, failed to appear for traffic citations and things like that. So we rely on uh, uh, the geocoding based on the address that's on the warrant. We can plot those on the map and go out and start serving arrest warrants and parolees and probationers also available here. Those folks who have been convicted and spent time in prison who are now living conditionally and subject to uh, home visits and drug screening and things like that, as well as sex offenders. So let's go back to our scenario and talk a little bit more about that response plan, specifically that point of do we have all of the available information to, to plan a response to this scenario? So one of the elements, uh, the commonalities, was that our suspect was, was picking their victims at ATM locations. So the information that we're lacking here is a list of all of the ATMs in our community. So that type of information is typically not something that a law enforcement agency will just have lying around or have in part of their database. When we do discovery prior to an implementation with the law enforcement agency, we sit down with them and look over all of the things that they have access to, uh, their RMS provider, their, their CAD or their dispatch system, if they have access to warrants, maybe they have some gang intel files and things like that. But we usually don't come across uh, something like like ATM information. So we've got to find another source of information for, for, that, inf for that information. Um, the most common two that would come to my mind are your city or county business licensing office or to go to the banking community directly. Um, any, any business that operates within a community will have a business license. There's data associated with that, with that entity in that uh, city or county licensing office database or again to the banking community and most law enforcement agencies will have a pipeline into the banking community through their fraud investigators. So we'll go through one or both of those channels and acquire the data that we need to, to help us develop this response plan to this situation. So what we want to do is get that list and process it and bring that into the GeoShield environment. And the way that we do that is using ArcGIS online. So I'm going to go to my AGOL account. I'll log in. And in preparation for today's webinar, I went ahead and prepared a file that we could upload uh, that would depict all of the ATM locations in the Daytona Beach area. So once I've logged in, I'm going to start a new map. From here, I can change the base layer if I choose to from uh, all of the, the available choices here. But what I want to do is upload that file. So I'll navigate to the file. 
and import it. So it's going to look at the fields in the file that I'm trying to bring in and match them to what it needs in AGOL to, to map those points appropriately or accurately. And then add the layer. So we've seen the map has reoriented back to Daytona Beach, which is where we want to be. We actually have ATM locations pretty much for uh, the entire Volusia County area. And from here, we can start to take advantage of some of the nice features in AGOL. We can do heat mapping or a number of other things. But again, based on the scenario that we're responding to, our goal is to bring this information back into GeoShield and start to compare it to some of the, the data that already exists in that environment. So let's change the icons to something that's a little more appropriate. like these great little ATM icons. And I'll change the size up just a little bit. So now we have all of the ATM locations plotted on the map with a nice icon that, that actually represents an ATM. So at this point in the process, we would save this. Gives us the opportunity to pick a title, to add tags, add a summary so that as my uh, library of maps grows in AGOL, I can quickly navigate to the one that I need. However, I've already taken these steps and saved this. So we're going to go back into GeoShield. And using the built-in tools, import that map. So now I'm going to sign into my my ArcGIS Online account right from GeoShield, so I'll enter the same credentials. So now I'm connected to my AGOL account, and I'm going to enter a search for that uh, particular map, which contained the letters ATM, and there it is, and add it to the map. So in addition to bringing in the layer of ATM locations and the icons, it also imports the base map that I had in that map. And I'm going to go ahead and remove that. So now we have an interactive layer of uh, ATM locations right in GeoShield that we brought in through AGOL. So now that we have it back, we begin to make comparisons and respond to um, and address some of those things in our response plan. So agencies have geographic boundaries within their, within their community, the areas that officers are assigned to patrol in. So if I'm the officer assigned to this geographic area that's outlined in the blue border, I know where the ATMs are located, and I know where if I'm not on a, a responding to a call for service, I, I want to do some extra patrols at those locations, I now know exactly where those, those ATMs are. So we have a pretty good distribution of ATM locations across our area. So that's a large area to try and, and respond to, to do the surveillance and the stakeouts and things like that. The thing that we haven't identified yet is where are the locations that have already been hit by this suspect. So what I did is did a second layer of those locations in AGOL. And now I'll import that as well. So of 125 ATMs, we see that the, the seven locations where the suspect has already committed robberies, and even though these are spread pretty widely across the Daytona Beach area, the, the area around where the crimes are occurring is pretty concentrated. So now we can focus our response uh, a lot more um, to one specific area rather than to try and, and boil the ocean, so to speak, and monitor all of the ATMs in the Daytona Beach area. So at this point, we can start to make some of those comparisons with other data sets, such as known offenders. So within the, 
the client's records management system, remember they'll have access to arrest histories, criminal histories, and for this example, parolees and probationers. So between the three subsets of parolees and probationers that are represented by the blue icons, we have about 2,600 offenders. So to try and, and do some analysis and identify those who may be involved given the volume is a pretty daunting task. But each one of these individuals has the attributes listed to them, their name, their gender, their race, their height, and so on. And also a description of what crimes they've been convicted of. So since we're taking a look at aggravated robberies, let's drill down and take a look at those individuals who have a history of committing robbery. So we'll look at our parolee and probationers data sets. Look for that field, that description, and select an operator. So what this has told us is that of about 2,600 offenders, there are 48 that have a history of committing robbery. So let's hide the rest of them for, for the moment. And not only is there a, a fairly small number, they're also pretty, uh, pretty concentrated in the same areas where these crimes are taking place. So now we're st really starting to drill down into uh, a list of suspects, a list of potential suspects who may be involved in these types of events. And if we wanted to go uh, one step farther, let's take a look at, at proximity and find out how many of these 48 offenders live, let's say, within a mile of one of these robberies. So using the, the built-in tools, we'll draw the one mile buffer around. Let me change that to victim locations. So we've got a one mile buffer around each of those seven robbery locations and it's identified 26 individuals who have a history of committing robbery that live within that area. So a much smaller list to, to work with. So this list would be part of both of those uh, plan execution phases. This list would go to the investigators who are doing the follow-up to try and identify a known suspect. And this would also go out to those people who were involved in the stakeout. So they would have uh, a sheet or more on each of these individuals with their picture and, and other personal information about these individuals and they could drill down even farther based on, on other things that are known about this crime series. Uh, scars, marks, and tattoos that were seen, the suspect's height, weight, hair color, and so forth. We can also use this to share information across the organization. So we'll create a report. And let's identify an area here. Let's change that a little bit. So what we've done is just created a border around the area where the robberies are taking place and asked you shield to identify uh, or select those 26 individuals that live within a mile of one of these locations. And we'll create a report from that. So it'll take a second for that report to create. But again, think of where we started just a few minutes ago. We knew we had a series of robberies taking place. We identified some factors, um, some elements within those robberies that had us focus in on ATMs. We identified a small geographic area or a smaller geographic area where those crimes were taking place. We brought in potential target locations. Um, all of the ATMs within our community identified potential offenders, all with the, the resources available through ArcGIS Online and GeoShield. So we've used that information, we've created a report, 
We can share this across the organization. Officers can use this for um, for their stakeouts to focus on on known offenders and anything else that's part of this. So it also has a list of those 26 offenders, and this was remember demo or sample data. So the information you see here is not what we would see in a live environment. We would see uh, much more detail about these individuals. So with respect to uh, what comes with GeoShield or some of the background information, uh, I'm going to hand off to Nick and he's going to discuss some of the, the technology behind GeoShield. Nick. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, so a couple of things to point out. Um, you saw a lot of things going on with how GeoShield displays the information, but it's, it's how we set this information up for a customer and also for anybody who currently has an ArcGIS either ELA in place or they have agreements already in place, so they're looking to get one. So we have some small um, agency agreements worked out where we can do different types of implementations, and those different implementations uh, take advantage of three different deployment options, and we can do a completely hosted by the agency on their infrastructure and on their premise, so everything's behind their own firewalls. Um, and so that's one of the first things that we look at is what type of deployment options are available to the customer. Um, another one would be a hosted environment in the cloud. And so it would be a SaaS or a software as a service. And if the customer has an ArcGIS environment already in place, then that's the third option where we do a hybrid. So we would have a deployment that's partially in the cloud and then partially um, leveraging what's already in place inside of the customer's environment. And so with all of these, we set up certain things inside of that CGIS requirements to ensure the protection of that data. Um, we try and make sure that you're still able to see all of the attributes that you're looking for, so the social security numbers, the dates of birth, and the really crucial information that helps with an investigation. We don't want to strip that out. So we work with you in order to ensure that that data is available, regardless of what type of platform implementation you decide to go forward with. Um, if you decide to go completely hosted inside of your own environment, then everything's retained behind your firewall. You have access to it within your own agency. Um, you normally will have the VPNs or the virtual private network set up so that you have that information behind everybody's firewall. The MDTs or MDCs are able to access it. Um, SAS, it's available and can be available, so it's exposed. So if you wanted to log in from a, an application um, platform, so a computer, a laptop, a tablet, or even a mobile device, to see these um, resources, you can do that. And that's a hosted environment. Um, and then the hybrid does the same thing. You have access to it both internally and externally from your agency's domain. And then we utilize things like two-factor authentication, which is an FBI requirement when we're exposing this data publicly that anybody who's gaining access to the applications has to go through those two um, steps in order to gain access to this information. And then regardless of what platform technology you utilize, all of that information is then shareable, um, whether it's through ArcGIS Online, through the built-in homepage that comes with GeoShield, or through the agency's portal, um, if you have ArcGIS portal in place. So you have a couple of different options. Um, one of the questions that just came up was whether or not this is only um, supported with AGOL. And hopefully I just answered that question to say no. It's not just so supported by AGOL. It's also on the server and then also with Portal. So we support all three. Um, as far as the next bullet point that we talk about, um, looking at the agile methodology, a lot of that is kind of vague, to um, even to me, to Dave. When we came into this company, we didn't know what Agile meant. What that means is when we're talking about a customer and they want to get a new feature or new implementation option, and they throw out the idea of, hey, what would it take for you guys to do something like this? Um, an example would be the cameras. That was a very hot button item for a lot of agencies. They wanted to see the cameras displayed on the map. So what we do is we prioritize based on customer needs and also what we see inside of the 
market. So the market is law enforcement and public safety. And if that need outweighs some of the other things that we're doing, then we adjust our development to include those new functions and features to really enhance what the customer needs and wants to become the top priority of our next development item. Then when we implement that, that's native for everybody. So everybody gains access to that information. Um, talking with John, they are just getting ready to do a release on near repeat. So with near repeat functionality, we have that in our roadmap to develop that option. And we're going to simplify some of that template and some of that process so that all the customers that take advantage of this will be able to see those near repeat locations and the predictive analysis that comes from near repeat inside of GeoShield. And it's not something that the users have to worry about, okay, now I need to install this new add-on or I have to install this new feature. We take care of that. And then we also provide the training so that you understand where that's utilized and how to utilize that new technology as it comes out. And all that becomes is a new button for you to click on inside of the GeoShield map. Um, all of this really takes advantage of the ecosystem within Esri. And when we look at the ecosystem, there are a lot of different partnerships that are going on. And so our focus is we want to take all of the things that Esri has done, all of the things that the agency has done, the city has done, and we want to bring them together into one location give that information a real big, powerful environment to operate in with simplified workflows, simplified management processes. And that's part of the, the philosophy behind this. And we keep it with a core thought of Esri is one of the leading mapping companies in the world. So let's take advantage of what they've already done and let's really push that information so that the frontline officer who has no mapping experience can leverage some of the capabilities that are available. And this is all built with that mindset that any of the law enforcement templates that are available, any of the common operating picture methodologies that are in there, um, things like incident management, uh, critical infrastructure information, all of those resources that you would see in a template or see in a app or a map we try and leverage and bring in here. And then you can also push that information back out to the officers and to the agency representatives throughout the police department and throughout the city as well. A couple of our agencies like to share some of this information with the city. They like to publish some of these maps to the public. So saving some of these maps, as you saw, it's very easy for us to do. Then that map can then be published out to a public website and it's available and accessible for everybody. We work with you to identify those things that you want that help your agency function faster and smarter, and then we put those in place for you. And so I'll go ahead and pass the time back over to Dave. Okay. Thank you, Nick. So 1.2 before I, I touch uh, on this slide is we can pull from AGOL with uh, when we come across a situation like what we've discussed today, but we can also export from GeoShield into AGOL. So if we have uh, some data that we need to do something um, more in depth with that uh, that is not part of GeoShield's core functionality, we can export data right into AGOL and then process and do the things that we need done to the data. So with the GeoShield implementation, the things that are included, ArcGIS server, that's what uh, handles and manages uh, all of the geocoding functionality within GeoShield. It comes with three years uh, service and support, that's typically how GeoShield is sold is on a three-year basis, and custom tailored data integration. Uh, during that pre-implementation discovery phase, we have uh, some pretty in-depth meetings with the client to identify what resources they have um, so that we can kind of tailor the, the implementation to what best meets their needs. We typically start with four data sources. Uh, a lot of agencies may have more than four, but we'll start with four, let them use the product for a while, and then start making some more informed decisions about what else they want to bring into the GeoShield environment. And there's really no limit to how many data sources they pull in there. We're also an enterprise solution. This was mentioned earlier. 
but everyone across the organization would have access to GeoShield. It can be set uh, with permissions, so people at the administrative level may have access to things that folks, uh, the, the rank and file, the officers in the field may not have access to. Uh, as an enterprise solution too, one of the kind of unanticipated benefits of this is is increased accountability. When you have patrol officers in the field who have access to this level of information, uh, these types of capabilities, you really raise the bar as far as accountability goes. When they can see where known offenders are, where they know exactly where crimes are occurring, where people with outstanding arrest warrants are located, uh, efficiency goes up right alongside accountability. Training is included with the GeoShield implementation that typically uh, takes place on site as well as uh, through methods like we're, we're doing here today through webinars and those types of mechanisms. And as Nick mentioned, we have a very robust roadmap and everything that's developed, whether that's something that comes through our partnership with Esri or that comes from feedback from our clients or that comes from within CyberTech, everything that becomes operational is rolled out to all of our clients. So it's a, a pretty good package uh, in that respect. This I'll hand, I'll hand back to you, John. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're going to take some questions, but first let's uh, look at some of the resources that we have out there. Um, first off, we have our both of our landing pages, uh, Esri's landing, law enforcement landing page, esri.com, industries, law enforcement, and then CyberTech's GeoShield landing page where you can more, learn more about what you saw today, www.geoshield.us. And um, our next webinar uh, is coming up a month from today, and in it we're going to discuss ways to implement our new crime analysis toolbox and predictive tool set into your existing workflows. So kind of a part two to last month's webinar. Um, uh, this webinar that we showed today will probably be up on our landing page within a week, um, as are all of our webinars. So uh, look for that next week. Um, some upcoming events and trainings that, um, that are coming your way include the Esri User Conference, which will be in San Diego June 27th through July 1st and the Esri National Security Summit, which, which is the two days before the user conference, um, June 25th and 26th. Uh, CyberTech will be at both of those attending the um, National Security Summit, and I think you guys are going to have a booth at the user conference, right? That is correct. We will be in booth 2608 at the user conference. Cool. So um, the awesome thing about our user conference is if you or your city or county have on maintenance ESRI licenses, you probably have free passes to the user conference. Um, it's, it's every year in San Diego, so if you have any questions about whether you have a pass or not, um, shoot me a message and I can check on it for you. Um, also, we have our GeoNet ESRI online community. It's a great place to connect, share, chat, collaborate on all things Geo. If, if you haven't already, check that out. And our MOOCs, a massive open online courses. Um, Esri hosts several of these throughout the year. They're completely free. Our next one's coming up July 20th, and it's uh, do-it-yourself geo apps. In it, we're going to show you how to combine location and narrative in one application to better communicate or tell a story. Um, each of these classes is four weeks long. Um, this one will have seven sections, and it takes about one to two hours per week. You work at your own pace, and and uh, at the end of the course, you get a on, you get a certificate that you can download and print and uh, show that you completed the course. Finally, uh, check out our training page. In addition to training that CyberTech gives you, we have a bunch of training resources um, on this Esri.com training main page, and also our solutions uh, download page. As uh, Nick mentioned, we have that new um, predictive analysis tool set that's going to be part of our crime analysis toolbox. That is set to be released this week, and you'll be able to download that at this page, um, arcgs.com, local government, law enforcement. Cool, so uh, let's take some questions. I think Nick's answered a lot of them, but uh, I have a couple questions, and uh, let's take some questions from, from our audience. Um, you, you guys talked about uh, integrating social media. Do you guys integrate 
um, other social media platforms that an agency might already have? Yes, we do. So those three that were depicted, we had Twitter, um, YouTube, and Flickr are kind of out of the box, but if a client agency is subscribing to something like Geofedia, that's easily, uh, easily brought into that environment as well. So, so social media, just like all the other systems that an agency has and sensors, you can integrate into GeoShield. Absolutely. And, and I think Nick answered a little bit. So, what? So, if my agency doesn't have ArcGIS or only has an ArcGIS desktop license, I can still get GeoShield. Do you go, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so. What we take advantage of is we have a couple of agreements in place with Esri where we can offer this solution if you don't have a really robust ELA in place and you have some simple licensing in place. Um, we would just talk specifically to your agency to find some background information on how that um, needs to be handled. But GeoShield is, in a sense, uh, agnostic. It, it just requires the mapping functionality that is offered by Esri. And so if you have access to some of that information, then we can um, get you set up with the GeoShield environment with all of the tools and the templates that are available to it. And depending on what version you have also depends on some of those templates because some of them are dependent on versions. So we would discuss that with you as well. So if, if, you, if you only have an ArcGIS desktop license, for example, with GeoShield you get access to ArcGIS Online and other ESRI platform specific tools. Yes, that is correct. Cool. Right. Um, we did have a question about pricing. Um, I don't think we're going to go into it in depth here, but pricing is based on your agency size and you know the size of the city you serve. Um, you'll find that if you're a small agency, it's very affordable. And um, if you if you have um, further questions about that, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Any other questions you saw in here, Nick, that you wanted to hit? There were a couple of questions that dealt specifically with the cameras. Um, and like we said, this was a trending item for us as a company that we saw the need from customers to have in place. And so to answer a couple of those questions that a couple of other people had asked, um, the camera access is dependent on a current agreements with businesses or current agreements with uh, locations throughout your city. Um, they are generally IP-based cameras or cameras connected to a VMS or video management system. So we would just have to see how you would want to access those and then see if we actually can access them. As far as the bandwidth and how we handle the bandwidth, that's all handled by the server and then that information is then transmitted out to the uh, car or to the desktop application and it's filtered or buffered down so you're not receiving high bandwidth usage just for streaming those videos, it's actually filtered or buffered down to a lower feed in order to transmit that information. If you want to access the full-fledged video, we will actually transfer you through the application into the VMS software so that you can go in directly and access it that way. So GeoShield seems like it gives you access to a lot of um, real-time capabilities. Is is GeoShield meant for a real-time crime center? Do I need to have a real-time crime center implementation to to use GeoShield, um, you know, to its full capabilities, or no? Oh, and that, great question, and that's come to us before. Um, you, there is no prerequisite to have a real-time crime center component within the agency to deploy GeoShield. And if you do have real-time crime center, this really is um, uh, kind of enhances that relationship between the crime center and the rest of the organization. So we worked for an agency that had both. And again, to put some of these capabilities into the hands of the end users kind of relieved the burden to some extent and allowed the crime center to focus on on some of the other things that that they were needed for because of the additional expertise and skill sets they had so no requirement to have a crime center in place to get the benefit of a GeoShield implementation cool and um, we did have a question from an international customer you guys are um, an internet, Esri is an international company and we have a lot of international users. 
and you guys, GeoShield can be sold overseas, is that correct? That is correct. So we would just have to talk with you about some of the requirements that are in place within your country um, as far as data protection or data um, information sharing. And once we have that understanding in place, then we are able to move forward with it. So there's no issues with international. Great. Okay, so um, I think we're going to end a little bit early here. We've, we've answered our questions, most of our questions in the chat window. Um, if you need to contact any of us um, about, as I talked about, the user conference and National Security Summit, you can email me. If you have any questions about upcoming webinars or ESRI training, also email me, and you can contact Dave or Nick with any questions you have about GeoShield. And uh, with that, uh, once again, our next webinar for uh, July is going to be implementing predictive analysis with the RGS platform. So. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you and have a good day.